Uh, right now, nationally, over 40% of college students report being too depressed to function. Over 60% say that they feel overwhelmingly anxious. And over 80% say that they constantly feel overwhelmed by all the things they have to do. And so this was pretty bad. You know, it made me realize that, you know, we're not in some ways meeting our educational mission. My guest today is Dr. Laurie Santos. Laurie is a renowned professor of psychology at Yale University. And she's got some good news and some bad news for us today. The bad news is we are tricking ourselves into being unhappy. The good news is we can choose to be happier. She covers these findings in her class, Psychology and the Good Life, which is the most popular course at Yale ever. She's also the host of the Happiness Lab podcast, and Lori is here today to teach us how we can be happier. Lori, it is so good to have you. Thanks so much for having me on the show. You know, uh, this is just a really, really uh, interesting topic to me. So what are some of our misconceptions of happiness? Yeah, this is a big one. We actually start our the class with this idea of the misconceptions because I think they're so powerful. You know, it's it's not that we don't think like we know what it takes to be happy. Like we have very strong intuitions about the kinds of things that make us happy. It's just the data suggests that most of those intuitions are wrong. You know, the biggest misconception is that we have to change our circumstances, right? You know, we need to be richer or thinner or more beautiful or have a better job or a better partner, right? We want to go around changing all those circumstances. But the research suggests that that's actually not the path to happiness. Like we'd be much better off if we tried to change our mindsets and our behaviors. So why are we out of touch with what makes us happy? Yeah, I think this is a big puzzle, right? I mean, I think part of it is cultural, right? You know, kind of capitalism works best if we don't like things about ourselves and are trying to change our circumstances and, you know, buy new things and so on. Um, But I think part of it is also just our biology. Like we're kind of wired badly when it comes to happiness, right? And that sort of makes sense. You know, evolution, natural selection, you know, it wasn't trying to make us happy. It was trying to get us to survive and get our genes into the next generation, right? You know, it didn't really care if we were feeling good about it. It just wanted us to sort of succeed. And so it makes sense that we have some bad theories when it comes to to happiness. But one of my favorite neuroscientific explanations for why we get it so bad is the fact that neurally speaking, all the circuits that code for our our wanting, you know, the kind of craving that we have for certain sorts of things, our motivation to go get certain things, those wanting circuits are completely different than the liking circuits. Those are the circuits that code how much we actually like what we get. You know, and that means that we have these wanting circuits that cause us to go out and like, you know, buy new things or switch things around. And we're doing that even though ultimately we're not going to like those things very much. And so I think there's lots of biological reasons from our evolutionary history to the way our brains are wired up that mean we really get it wrong more than we think. But lots of people think that they just have to accept being unhappy, but your research shows that they can overcome it. Yeah, I think this is yet another misconception. You know, we think that happiness might be in some sense built in. You know, maybe it's our genes, maybe it's the way we were raised, but by the time we're adults, we have a certain happiness level and that's it. We kind of can't change it. And this seems to be one of the biggest misconceptions. You know, every available study in positive psychology suggests that there are interventions that every single one of us can do to feel a little bit happier. Uh, The bad news is that we got to put in the work, right? You know, like we can change our happiness. That is the good news. But the bad news is that to do so, you know, just like all of the good things in life, it's going to take a little bit more effort than, you know, we often want to put in. So some of your research in the beginning started with monkeys. What did you learn when you went down that path? Yeah, well, I always joke that my day job was sort of studying animals. Um, I was really interested in the origins of cognition, kind of these special ways that humans think and what kind of makes the human mind a little bit special. Um, And I think that, you know, these misconceptions we have about happiness is sort of one of those things. Um, But my path to happiness sort of started in a different way. I actually took on a new role outside of my normal research here at Yale. Um, I became a head of college on campus. And what that means is that I live with students on campus. My, my house is the house that you 
you can see in the background here mm -hmm. um, is actually part of the dorm, right? So I live in Silliman College. I eat in the dining hall with students and kind of hang out with them really closely. And this was the spot where I really started to realize that college life wasn't like I remembered, you know, when I was there, you know, back, you know, now 20 years ago or so. Um, college students these days are a lot more depressed, anxious, and just stressed out than I remember. And this is true not just at Yale. This is not like an Ivy League phenomenon. This is true nationally. Uh, right now, nationally, over 40% of college students report being too depressed to function. Over 60% say that they feel overwhelmingly anxious. And over 80% say that they constantly feel overwhelmed by all the things they have to do. And so this was pretty bad. You know, it made me realize that you know, we're not in some ways meeting our educational mission, you know, here at Yale and elsewhere, if we're not really addressing this mental health crisis. And so my path to being a monkey, from being a monkey researcher to becoming a happiness researcher was really recognizing how staggering this problem is for our young people, for these students I was teaching in my classes, and just recognizing that we needed some tips to help us do better. Wow. So you're your findings then led to, which I think is, is so interesting, the most popular course ever at Yale. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. So, you know, faced with all this kind of mental health dysfunction that I was seeing on campus, you know, which was so compelling, you know, when you talk to these students who are, are experiencing like acute panic attacks or suicidality, you know, they're, they're 19, you know, they're at Yale, they have everything going for them. It was just so striking to me to, to witness such unhappiness. And so I decided to do something about it. I thought, you know, the best way to kind of tackle this issue as a professor is to sort of teach students. So I said, let me develop a new class. And so I decided to put together a class on everything that the field of psychology knows about how to improve your happiness. Um, and again, this wasn't a class about platitudes. This was really evidence-based approaches to improving your well-being. And so I kind of put it all together, you know, thinking it was a new class at Yale and only a few students would take it. Uh, so you can imagine my surprise when I walked into over a thousand students trying to take the class. Um, in the end, over almost a quarter of the entire Yale student body was trying to take the class. Um, and that told me something different. That told me that students were really voting with their feet. You know, they wanted to do something about this culture of feeling anxious and stressed. And in some ways, they really wanted evidence-based approaches. You know, they didn't want a bunch of platitudes. They wanted science-backed, evidence-based approaches to doing better. So how long, if I may ask, have you been doing the course now? Yeah, so I taught it for the first time in 2018. Um, so I've only taught the class once. Um, 2018, nowadays, you and I are talking in the midst of 2020 and this sort of crazy challenging time. And so 20, 2018 feels like many moons ago in terms of happiness research. Um, but I taught the class once and since then I've kind of been in different positions and on sabbatical, I realized I might have to take a little hiatus of teaching the class uh, at Yale. And that was one of the reasons we decided to put the class online. Um, we, we partnered up with Coursera.org that gives kind of digital content away for free. And we plopped the class online so that anyone in the world who wanted to could take the class. Um, wow. That too went a little bit more viral than I expected. Um, we now have over 3 million learners who are taking the class online uh, from hundreds, literally hundreds of different countries. Um, in fact, just this past weekend, we saw that there was a new learner who came from Antarctica, you know, which really shows us that you know, people yeah. all over the planet you know, want these tips for how they can feel happier. So, Lori, if we could, let's talk about the things that make us happy. So what I'm going to do, or, you know, maybe don't make us happy, but <laughs> what I'm going to do is go through the list. And I'm going to ask you to explain them. Is that is that good? That sounds great. Yeah. All right. Okay. How about gratitude? Yeah. So this is one that I think we get wrong a lot, especially during challenging times, right? You know, we think, you know, that the path to feeling better if I'm having a bad day is to complain about it or to gripe to a friend, Right. Um, and the research suggests that that's kind of not the case. In fact, if you look at happy people, happy people spend time counting their blessings. They spend time focused on the kinds of things they're really grateful for. Now, you might say, well, that's because they're happy. You know, maybe they don't have as much to gripe about. But the research shows that if you take someone that's not feeling so happy and you have that person focus on the kinds of things they're grateful for, you know, maybe by just scribbling down three to five things they're grateful for every night, research shows that uh, subjects will increase their happiness in as little as two weeks just through doing that simple gratitude exercise. And so gratitude is a completely free, not even very time consuming path to improving your well-being simply by changing your attention around. You're sort of focused a little bit more on the blessings in life rather than the hassles. And, and it seems to work really quite strikingly. That's interesting because I know families who actually make that a dinnertime ritual, if you will, uh, for their families. Interesting. So what about time affluence? What is that? 
Yeah. So time affluence is this new term that I quite love. It's it's time affluence is the subjective sense that you have some free time. You're kind of like wealthy or affluent in time, right? Mm -hmm. It's the opposite of what many of us feel a lot, which is time famine, where we're literally starving for time. And the research shows that time famine seems to affect our bodies almost like real hunger famine, right? We go into sort of triage mode. We, we feel really bad. And in fact, time famine, the sense that you don't have very much time, it can have a huge impact on your well-being. In fact, when you self-report that you feel time famished a lot, that's as bad for your well-being as if you self-report that you're unemployed, right? You know, so we know we need to fix unemployment. That's such a terrible thing for people's happiness. That's how bad time famine is. And so the research shows that if we want to be happier, we need to focus on opening up some time. We need to become a little bit wealthier in time. And this sometimes means taking things off our plate rather than putting more things on it. You know, sometimes for happiness, we think we need more stuff. We need to buy more stuff or get more things. We forget that happiness can sometimes come from removing stuff from our plate. Um, and then that can be really powerful for our happiness too. So being other oriented, what does that mean? Yeah. So I think, you know, other oriented is sort of the opposite of in some ways being self-oriented or kind of selfish. Right. And I think it plays out in sort of two ways. One is just the importance of kind of connecting with other people and just being around other people. But being other oriented is also involved in the extent to which we're sort of focused on other people's needs as opposed to our own. Yeah. And this is really countercultural right now. You know, I think, you know, these days there's a lot of talk about self-care and treat yourself, you know, self, self, self. If you look at happy people, this seems like a bad strategy. Happy people are more focused on other people's needs rather than their own. Not because they're forced to, or, you know, they hang out with demanding people. Like they just choose to focus on the kinds of things that might help, help others. You know, they give more to charity. Um, they spend more time kind of thinking about how they can help the people around them. And you might again say, you know, maybe that's because they're happy, they're kind of in a good mood, they want to do nice stuff for other people. But the research shows that if you force people to do nicer things for others, the research suggests that then they might also become happier over time. Um, one study was very cute. It walked up to people on the street and handed them some money. And it told those subjects how to spend the money. That by the end of the day, subjects either had to spend the money on themselves, so they had to treat themselves, or they had to spend that money on someone else. So they had to do something nice for somebody in their life. Um, and what the research showed was that at the end of the day, and even at the end of the week, people who spent the money on others were happier. Now, again, this sort of you know plays into all our misconceptions. We think, you know, if I want to do something nice for myself, I need to buy myself a manicure or myself something new, you know. Like, but the research shows that we might be better off spending that money to help someone else. Let's talk about venting. Does venting work? Yeah, well, venting, you know, is kind of griping or sort of complaining. I think it sort of depends on how you're doing it is what the research says. You know, so venting where you just kind of vent and vent and vent, but nothing ever changes, that doesn't really work as much, right? Like that just means you're kind of complaining about things. You're sort of uh, training your attention to focus on negative stuff but nothing's really changing. If you want to sort of gripe in a more positive way, you might want to think about griping in a sort of problem solving way. So you're kind of thinking through the issues that are there with a real focus on what problem solving you can use to, uh, to fix it. You know, griping for griping's sake is kind of at an opportunity cost because what you could be doing, you know, something we mentioned before, which is just sort of taking time for gratitude, you know, rather than focus on all the gripes and all the hassles, you could actually switch your attention to the kinds of things that you're grateful for. And the research shows again that, you know, that gratitude can be so powerful. So, you know, every time you're hanging out with your girlfriend and, you know, griping over a glass of wine, if you could just stick in a few of the blessings in your life, you know, instead of, sort of focused only on the gripes, that can actually improve your mood more than you expect. So let's talk about mindfulness, because this has become very popular. Tell us about it. Yeah, so mindfulness, it, it's important to kind of define mindfulness, because I think, you know, there's a lot of hype out there. So mindfulness, as scientists think about it, is the act of intentionally paying attention, like intentionally sort of focusing and being present, but with a particular kind of attitude. And it's an attitude of non-judgment, kind of just letting things be. Um, you know, mindfulness is sort of a part of a set of practices that have existed for thousands of years, you know, from Buddhist traditions to others. You know, these things have focused on this idea that if we can just be present, you know, in the like in the present moment in a sort of non-judgmental way, that we might feel better. You know, and this is what the practice of meditation in many of these uh, spiritual traditions is trying to achieve. This, this practice where you sort of focus on paying attention 
intentionally and with a particular kind of attitude. Um, and I think one of the reasons this sort of practice has lasted thousands of years is because it works. You know, we've known that from our spiritual leaders for a long time, but we now know it from scientific work and neuroscientific evidence. Uh, research shows that the simple act of meditating, even for a little while a day, can reduce activation in regions of your brain that tend to mind wander. And we know that a wandering mind, you know, a mind that's ruminating and thinking about all this stuff not being in the present moment, that just seems to make us more unhappy. And so the simple act that we're doing practices that allow us to kind of bring our brain back to the present moment, uh, that can be quite powerful. And if you've ever done meditation, you know how this works. You know, if you've done meditation, you know, you sit there and think like, okay, I'm going to think about my breath. And then you're like, two seconds later, you're like thinking about what you're going to have for dinner tonight. And then if you're doing it right, you say, oh, you know, like, let me just bring it back, right? That act of sort of yanking your attention back to the present moment it's almost like doing bicep curls for your concentration, right? You're sort of increasing the extent to which you can pay attention and stay in the moment, not just while you're meditating, but later. And that means that you're more present and, and more ready to savor, you know, a conversation with your spouse later that night or to notice, you know, the taste of your coffee in the morning because you're there to notice it. And so mindfulness really allows us to sort of pay attention to whatever is going on and also to allow and accept things, you know, just to sort of let them be as they are. So there's a definite connection then between mindfulness and the time of fluence, right? Because you have to take that time. Yeah, I think that's right. I think one of the things that mindfulness gives us is it allows us to kind of be there and to notice what's going on. You know, so often when you're time famished, you're just rushing from one thing to another and just kind of triaging things. You feel so frantic that you don't have time to just be present and just be. Um, I think mindfulness also connects to some of the other things we were talking about, about the fact that, you know, it's not really our circumstances that matter. You know, if we get good at allowing ourselves to just be as we are, be in the present moment, non-judgmentally, allow it to be there, not changing things. That means we don't have to change the stuff in our life. We never need to buy anything or shift our circumstances. We can just get good at just allowing things to be. And that gives us a certain peace. You know, it allows us to sort of stop craving and stop going for stuff that's mm. just not going to work for our happiness. Mm. That's such a good point. Okay, now I know from a couple of different interviews, I think Greg McEwen with Essentialism was one of them, but, but it's come up with the Starettes over and over again with different people. Where does sleep come in? Yeah, well, this is another one. You know, sometimes when we're thinking about happiness, we forget that our physical health is involved in happiness, too. And I think that's where sleep really comes in. Um, research shows that getting the appropriate amount of sleep matters a lot for our mental health. And appropriate amount of sleep, just in case listeners need a reminder, is, you know, probably seven to eight hours a night. That's what we should be shooting for. Research shows that if you're getting much less than that, even if you're getting something like five hours a night, you could be showing significant reductions in things like your mood over time. Um, that's also in addition to all the physical health problems that come with not sleeping enough. You know, things like an increased risk of stroke, an increased risk of heart attack, an increased risk of certain kinds of cancers, right? Like not getting enough sleep is just really bad. Um, and that's one of the reasons that I've, I've found so profound of teaching this class to my college students. Mm -hmm. You know, many college students these days are just not getting enough sleep. You know, they think, oh, sleep is for people who are weak and, you know, I'm going to study and party and things. And what they don't realize is that they're negatively contributing not just to their physical health, but their mental health, too. So sleep is super important. I tell my students, if you want to promote your mental health, uh, getting some positive sleep hygiene in is really powerful. You know, so put the phone away before you go to bed. You know, make sure that like your room is dark and you're kind of comfortable. These things can matter a lot more, not just for like getting enough sleep, but you know, for improving our mood, for feeling less depressed and less anxious over time. I think that we just do not realize what a commodity sleep is. And I think that we think, oh, I've got to go to bed. I've got so much to do, right? But it should be the opposite <laughs> thought yeah. process. It yeah. needs to be a priority for sure. <laughs> okay, so let's, if you will, how does all of this tie together then for our physical health? Yeah, so I think this is one thing, you know, sleep is sort of part and parcel in this. I think we forget that our, 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 we are just biological creatures, right? Like our emotions and our moods, they come from our body, right? And so if we're not focused on our physical health, we might be missing out on really important aspects of our mental health. You know, we talked about sleep, but another big one is exercise, right? Mm. There's research suggesting that a half hour of moving your body in the morning, like just a half hour of cardio, that can be as effective in reducing symptoms of depression as something like an anti-depression 
prescription, like a, you know, a prescription of Zoloft or something like that. Mm -hmm. There's also evidence that exercise can bump our mood up for a long time. So you do a half hour of cardio at 9am. How long is your mood bumped up? Well, I can come back Tuesday at around one or 2pm and still find that you're in a better mood, right? Mm -hmm. And notice I said exercise moving your body. I didn't say like hating your body or trying to get your body to be in a particular shape, right? It's really not about paying attention to how your body looks. It's about paying attention to how your body feels, right? Like that's where kind of exercise can really make us happier. And so that's just one example. But, you know, the work suggests that we really need to be paying attention to our bodies too if we want to improve our mental health. Mm. Okay. So let's talk and turn to loneliness. I know that even before COVID, loneliness was kind of an epidemic. So let's, can you be lonely and happy? Yeah, the research suggests maybe not. In fact, there's one very famous paper um, in the field of positive psychology by uh, Ed Diener and Marty Seligman. The, the title of the paper is called Very Happy People. And they look at all these different factors that, that are necessary for having high happiness. And the one they come up with is social connection. They actually say that social connection is a necessary feature for high happiness. And it seems to make sense in part because if you look at happy people, happy people are just more social. They make time for their friends and family members. They make time for the people they care about. They're, they're actually just physically around other people more often. And so I think that we can forget that, you know, one path to happiness is this idea of being connected. You know, we mentioned before being other oriented, right? Being other oriented is also it has to do with whether or not we're around other people all out of the time, whether we make time for the people in our lives that we care about. Uh, and so research really suggests that one path to happiness is to become a little bit more social. And, and one thing to know is that that's true for introverts and extroverts. Sometimes I you know, give this advice and introverts say, oh, yeah, yeah, that's great for all the extroverts out there. No, the research suggests that introverts are just more mistaken about how much they need social connection when they actually get it in a very natural way. They, too, will bump up in terms of their well-being. You know, it's interesting because uh, most people think I'm an extrovert and they, they may even argue with me about it. But I know that I, I get my energy when I'm alone. I know that that's where I really fill my tank up. But at the same time, I can tell you during COVID, I it got so hard not to see people. Um, I needed people. You know, and so it was it was good when things opened up a little bit more. So let's talk about alleviating loneliness then. What about most people think social media is a place to go? What are your findings there? Yeah, well, I think, you know, social media, I feel like is kind of sort of the nutra suite of social connection, right? Like it feels really easy. It's a really low startup cost, right? I just hop on Instagram or hop on Facebook or something and I'm kind of scrolling through. But just like kind of nutra suite, it's sort of empty calories, right? Like we're not really getting the nutritious form of social okay. connection we need. Um, nutritious social connection, you know, the best case would be, you know, together with other humans in real life, you know, during COVID that's tricky. But the research shows that in real time is kind of just as good. You you know, you and I are, are talking over the internet in real time here. And, you know, it's pretty good. We feel like we're sort of socially connecting, right? Um, and that is the difference between why could talking over something like Zoom or FaceTime, why it works better than sort of social media, even things like texting, right, where you're kind of out of out of step in terms of the timing. You know, we're really built to connect like normal social primates, which would be in real life. And mm -hmm. the problem with social media is that it kind of has a lot of the features of social connection, but it's missing the stuff that really seems to matter. In addition, social media can be problematic in other respects. One is just that it seems like sometimes social media and our use of social media can come at an opportunity cost of in real life social connection. Mm -hmm. You know, I can, you know, speak to this just in my own life, how many times my husband's talking to me and I'm like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and I'm looking at something on my phone. And then I realize like, oh, I totally just didn't literally didn't hear anything he just said, right? You know, or, you know, you walk out, you know, these days, you know, back, I remember before COVID and I would go out to restaurants and see a whole family that was sitting at a meal together, each with their phone out looking at it, right? So there's this in real life social connection that they could harness that they're missing out on because of the kind of thing they're doing on their phones. And so um, I actually think that, you know, we should really pay close attention to how we're using technology during this time, that low startup cost and those instant little hits, these reward hits we get from likes and things like that. They're very seductive, but ultimately they leave us not feeling the nutrition from social connection that we really need. Huh. That is such an interesting point. We just spoke to Nicholas Carr and Nicholas was talking about that, that we were so distracted with our phones uh, and social media that even having it present 
physically in a place when you're doing something else, it can distract. What are you finding with that? Yeah, I mean, there's lots of surprising evidence about how the mere presence of a phone, even when we're not using it, can really mess with us. Um, one study by Liz Dunn and her colleagues showed that the simple act of having your phone out can inhibit the amount that you smile uh, to other people around you. Again, even when you're not using it, like say you're waiting in a waiting room and your phone is just there, it's off. Um, but just having it there is detracting from the real life social connection you could have. And if you think about it, it makes sense, right? Like your brain is smart. Your brain knows that on the other side of that little device is so much interesting stuff. You know, the entire library of Alexandria, you know, every picture you've taken since like the early 90s, right? Like all of your social media accounts, your email, like porn, cat pictures, right? Like the internet has all kinds of great stuff. And sometimes it has such great stuff, it makes it hard to pay attention to the present moment, right? You know, your brain knows that you have to inhibit every single time you want to look at that. Um, on my podcast, I talked to Liz Dunn, who does work on this, and she says, you know, imagine if instead of, you know, taking your phone to your dinner table, you took a big wheelbarrow and then the wheelbarrow was all that stuff, you know, like, like DVDs of cat videos and all these photo albums and all these books and, you know, interesting pictures and like, you know, little audio clips you could listen to. Like, you know, if that wheelbarrow was sitting there beside your dinner table, you'd be distracted, right? You'd want to like look through it and check out those photo albums and things like your brain knows that in your pocket, you have that distraction all the time. And I think we're only now coming to terms with the consequences of this kind of distraction. You know, the good news, though, is that we can recognize that, you know, you can leave your phone far away in the other room. You know, we forget that we have the power to sort of strategically decide when we have this technology around us. Mm -hmm. um, we can also try to use some of the other tips we mentioned to do a little bit better with our phones. You know, one of those tips is mindfulness. Um, and in another episode of my podcast, I interviewed Catherine Price, who's an author of a book called How to Break Up with Your Phone. She's fantastic. Um, but she gives us this little mnemonic we can use when we want to interact with our phones, this acronym WWW, where she says we should ask ourselves, what for, why now, and what else? You know, when you just happen to find your phone in your hand, like, what was I, what was this for? Was I trying to look up a recipe or something? And now I'm like on Facebook, like what happened, right? Um, why now? You know, was there a reason? Or maybe you're just turning to your phone because you are anxious, or maybe you were bored, or maybe, you know, you had some shame feeling or something else. Like, why did you, you know, why now? And then the, all, the most important part, which is what else, right? What's the opportunity cost? What are you not doing in real life because you're looking at your phone? Uh -huh. And these three questions, I think, can help us become much more mindful to like notice what's going on, no judgmentally, about why we're interacting with our phone. And that sort of mindfulness can cause us to think about if we want to do something different the next time. Huh. I love that. I'm just going to have to bring a wheelbarrow to the table <laughs> next time with my middle schoolers. Okay. <laughs> Be a good thing. So let's talk about you. hundreds of thousands of people, Lori, have taken your course. What kind of impact have you seen? Yeah, well, we, we are just starting to take like, you know, like scientific empirical data on what's happening, where we measure people's happiness before the course and after. And what we're seeing so far is that on average, people's happiness tends to go up after taking the class on average, on a sort of 10 point happiness scale from like, you know, zero, not very happy to 10, very happy, people tend to go up about a whole point on that scale, which is pretty impressive. Uh -huh. But I think the the reason is important. It's not just that they're learning about happiness. It's that the class actually has homework where we make people put these practices into effect in their own life. So you're not just hearing, oh, yeah, gratitude is good and meditation, that's good. You actually have to do homework where you write down things you're grateful for, you know, try out meditation, you know, commit to getting eight hours of sleep a night, you know, make a new social connection. We have our learners actually do as homework the practices that we know bump up happiness. And therefore, in some sense, it's not surprising that the impact is really positive. We know these things can improve your happiness if you do them. I think the class just allows people to start forming this habit in which doing these things becomes a little bit more natural. So in the homework and what they're doing, do you think that these ideas can help everyone? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the, the, the commitments I made when I was teaching about all these tips for happiness was that I wanted to pick tips for happiness that would work for everyone. Things that were universal, that weren't just yeah. culturally bound, ones that we had a lot of data for. And I think really, you know, the evidence suggests if you engage with these things, you will become a little bit happier. 
And I want to have one caveat to that, because I think these tips do, in fact, work for everyone. But depending on where you are, you might need these tips or something else. And the analogy I like to use is imagine if, you know, instead of being a happiness researcher, I was sort of a cardiologist. And you came to me and you said, you know, doctor, I have really high blood pressure. I might say, well, the interventions you want to do there is you want to, you know, eat right and you want to hop on the treadmill for an hour a day or something like that, right? But imagine I was a cardiologist and you came up to me and you said, doctor, I'm having an acute a heart attack right now, like cardiac arrest, I'm in it right now, what should I do? I wouldn't say, well, you should hop on the treadmill, you know, right? I would say like, oh my gosh, you know, like, you know, I don't know, I'm not a cardiologist, so I don't know what you do, but like, it'd be something extreme. It'd be something for the acute situation you're in. Mental health works the same way, right? You know, most of these tips are for people who feel like they're, you know, not flourishing enough. They're feeling a little bit depressed or maybe a little bit anxious. These are the kinds of things that can help. If you are acutely feeling suicidal, if you're in the middle currently of a panic attack, you know, my advice is not going to be like, oh, take out a gratitude journal. You really do need a different kind of care, a different kind of care that can deal with those acute situations. But if you're in recovery from your depression, you know, if you're kind of working on your anxiety, you know, that's when these kinds of tips can come in. And some, in lots of ways, these tips are almost like preventative medicine so that mental health things, mental health issues don't get much worse. Well, thank you, Lori. I want to know if it's okay with you if we take some audience questions now. That would be fantastic. Okay. All right. So many children experience a lot of anxiety. What can parents do to help their kids be happier? Yeah. One of the things I think parents forget when they're thinking about happiness in their kids is how they need to focus on their own happiness first, right? Mm -hmm. We know that happiness is catchy. Uh, there's a lot of evidence for what's called emotional contagion. So, uh, you know, if you're feeling happy and joyous and laughing all the time, you know, that will transmit to the people around you. If you're feeling kind of anxious or scared or something like that, that will transmit too. And honestly, when I talk to parents who are worried about their kids' anxiety, often the parents themselves have some anxiety that they might be dealing, needing to deal with, right? And so I think one piece of advice for parents is to try Try to work on your own emotions first, right? What are you doing to make sure you're regulating your anxiety? You know, are you kind of putting in the meditation and the exercise and the sleep? Sometimes just the act of changing your own emotions can actually be really powerful for your kids. It's kind of like putting your own oxygen mask on first before helping others. But it's also just knowing that, you know, if you're an anxious parent, that's going to transmit. And the good news is that there are things that you can do to improve your anxiety, which will in the end wind up helping your family too. Very good advice. Okay. Question number two here. Can anyone take your course? Yeah. So it's available online completely for free. Uh, just go to Coursera.org and look for the science of well-being. Or if you forget that, just Google Yale happiness class online and you'll probably find it. Okay. And given that they're listening to your podcast, I imagine these are podcast listeners. Um, you should also check out the Happiness Lab podcast um, where you can get these tiny, tiny little bites of wisdom, not in a full class form, but in, you know, in your normal podcast feed. Absolutely. Okay. Question number three. What about thrill seekers? Can something like skydiving make you happier? Yeah, well, I think these are kind of, you know, the, there's lots of different things that we can do to kind of increase happiness in the moment. Um, what, one way to answer this question is to recognize that happiness has a couple different com components, right? There's sort of being happy in your life and being happy with your life. So being happy in your mm -hmm. life are the kind of positive emotions you're experiencing during the moment. Are you feeling joy? Are you feeling laughter? You know, are you not feeling lots of negative emotions, right? And there's lots of things we can do to increase that. You know, thrill seeking, you know, skydiving for a thrill seeker might be that. You know, savoring a really delicious, you know, like meal might be that for somebody who really likes food, you know, or listening to a wonderful concerto, right? Like there's wonderful things we can do in our life to feel happy. But we also need to feel happy with our life, which is sort of the second component. And that's what researchers call life satisfaction. It's the answer to the question, all things considered, how happy are you with your life? And the problem is if we just go for the thrills, you know, if we just go for the hedonic stuff, we might be missing out on doing things that really give us life satisfaction and meaning. And so you want to balance the kind of in your life and with your life. But, you know, if in your life it feels good to jump out of a plane, you know, go for it. Not necessarily my thing, um, but if it works for you, then that can help. <laughs> that, that would be my son's thing, not me. So, <laughs> all right. Next question. Uh, having 100,000 Instagram followers, does that make someone happy? 
Yeah, well, the answer again, I think seems to be probably not, right? You know, there's lots of people with more than 100,000 Instagram followers who are pretty miserable, right? Um, and I think one of the reasons gets back to a feature of happiness we often forget about, which is this phenomena called hedonic adaptation. It's the process where we just get used to stuff. You know, so when you have like, you know, 10 Instagram followers thinking like, oh my gosh, I'm going to get 100,000 followers. I'm going to be such an influencer. That might seem cool. But as soon as you get 100,000, now you're just focused on getting to a million, right? Wow. And we know this if, empirically speaking from people in terms of uh, having their salaries and in, in terms of money, right? You know, we often think that money will make us happier. But the problem is, as soon as you get more money, you want even more. In fact, one study looked at people at different income levels and asked how much money would you need to be fully satisfied, right? Like you, you wouldn't need any more money to, to be any happier. And so researchers asked folks who were earning $30,000 and these folks say, if I just had $50,000 a year, I would be happy, right? And you know, so in theory, people earning 50,000 or more should just be good, which shouldn't want any more money. Um, in, in this one uh, paper that talked about this, researchers asked people earning $100,000, are you happy? And they said no. But what's interesting is they said they needed two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to be happy. You know. Now, so two things there. One is like you never get to a point where you're happy. At least that's what the research suggests. But more, as you get more money, you tend to want more. Like the ratio between thirty thousand and fifty thousand is actually like less than the ratio between one hundred thousand and two hundred fifty thousand. Right. Like you, you need more as you get more money. And I think this is true for any good thing in life, whether that's like you know more Instagram followers, more money, more material possessions, better better car, a better house. As soon as we get something like we like, we get used to it and we feel like we need more to get to get any happiness. This is a question that I really love because it's something I'm fascinated and interested in because you're also the director of Yale's Canine Cognition Lab. So tell us a little about that and how how does that research inform your thinking about happiness? Yeah, well, again, this sort of gets back to, you know, I mentioned that in my in my day job and in my you know life before being a happiness researcher, I studied animals. Um, I studied uh, monkeys to kind of look at the evolutionary origins of how people think. But I also studied dogs in part because that can tell us a little bit about the nurture side of nature nurture, right? You know, dogs grow up in the same environment as people. And so we can look to them to try to figure out how our environment shapes our cognition or shapes how we think. And so the Canine Cognition Center brought in dogs from the community and just studied how they made decisions and how how they thought about different problems. We we're really focused on whether or not dogs learn in a lot of the same ways as say a human child might. And so, you know, that research was really cool. You know, we learned a lot about sort of the origins of cognition and things. You know, we were a little bit interested in human animal interaction, right? This bond between humans and animals, which seems to, in many cases, be really relevant for our happiness and our happiness boosts. But again, you know, it was kind of like, you know, it's like my day job and that sort of a way to think about the origins of cognition, um, but it's a little disconnected from the happiness stuff. I always say the connection is I really love the work that I did, you know, working on animals, so studying them made me really really happy. Um, but the, the there's little overlap in terms of the actual research itself. So Lori, before you go, let's just make sure people know exactly where all they can find you. Yeah, so you can check me out on Twitter at Lori Santos, just my name. Uh, and if you want to learn more, you should definitely check out the Happiness Lab podcast, which you can download wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, and if you too want to take this fantastic Yale class that you've heard so much about today, you can check it out at the science of well-being on Coursera.org. Thank you so much for being here. It's appreciate all that you do. Thanks so much for having me. Look, we have lots of great interviews on Melda Live, so hit like and subscribe. There's much more to come.